Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm afraid we're starting a little bit late, and so we will have to be. Hello. Oh. Wait tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> so we'll have to be extremely tight with our time and strict on that. Um, um, and it's, I welcome um, both sides this morning. If, um, a me members representative of the United States. And um, we're dealing in this hearing, which is the second one this morning, on the labor rights in the automotive industry in the United States. And this was hearing was requested by the United Automo uh, Automobile, Aerospace and Agricultural mm -hmm. Implement Workers of America. And uh, um, we, if you would just, when you speak, um, 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 introduce yourselves, name and, and position. And we'll, each side will have 15 minutes, I'm afraid, so you have to. Thank you so much. So please start. Uh, good morning, members of the commission, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Christine Peter, and I am the International Affairs Director for the United Auto Workers Union, UAW. <laughs> okay. Um, the UAW is one of the largest and most diverse unions in North America. I want to first thank the Commission for convening this hearing on labor rights in the automotive industry in the United States. Sadly, the obstacles faced by U.S. auto workers are also faced by workers in other sectors of the U.S. economy. But it's worthwhile to focus on the automotive sector because it provides a snapshot of how the United States middle class has been decimated in recent years. In the, in the post-World War II U.S. economy, auto workers led the way in improving wages, social benefits, and working conditions. Successive collective bargaining agreements lifted these workers' living standards to the point that many could purchase their own home, um, and afford to send their children to college. But in recent years, as corporations and right-wing politicians have waged a war on collective bargaining, there are two separate worlds for auto workers in the United States. In one world, workers are relatively well-paid, are covered by good health insurance plans, enjoy safer working conditions, and have ongoing dialogue with their employers. In the other world, Workers receive lower pay, suffer higher injury rates, lack due process in the workplace, and experience a higher incidence of precarious work. What differentiates these two worlds is whether workers engage in collective bargaining with their employer. For over 80 years, it's been the official practice of the United States to encourage the practice of procedure of collective bargaining and protect the exercise by workers of full freedom of association, self-organization, and designation of representatives in their own choosing. And that's a quote from our US Labor Code. Yet despite this policy, and despite worldwide recognition that workers' rights are human rights, workers have the human right to freedom of association, US workers do not have fair access to the mechanism of collective bargaining. In fact, only 6.4% of the private sector is unionized. So this is, you can see what a massive problem this is. Most of the US automotive workers that do engage in collective bargaining established that relationship with their employers in the 1930s and 1940s. While that relationship has been difficult at times, it has been a respectful relationship that has allowed workers to enjoy a decent standard of living and the companies to achieve profitable, profitable operations. In recent years, however, and especially since the 1990s, foreign multinational auto companies have established operations in the United States, primarily in the southern states. These companies took advantage of the lower wage and benefit levels in the region, and their workers are not covered by collective bargaining agreements. They were also the beneficiaries of a bidding war between these states and received billions of dollars in taxpayer money. Government officials have been vocal in expressing their opinion that workers in these plants should not form unions and bargain with their employers. 
In fact, the most stunning example of interference by elected officials in an organizing cam campaign is the recent case of Volkswagen and the state of Tennessee. In 2008, Volkswagen agreed to build an assembly plant in Chattanooga and has received approximately 577 million in subsidies from the state and local governments. A TV journalist in the Tennessee State Capitol discovered that when an additional 300 million in subsidies were negotiated with Volkswagen in 2013, the incentives were, quote, subject to works council discussions between the state of Tennessee and VW being concluded to the satisfaction of the state of Tennessee. While there is no public record of the content of the discussions, one is left to wonder why Tennessee officials included this statement in the final document other than to try to prohibit union representation. Less than a month later, both the Tennessee United States Senators sent a letter to Volkswagen CEO urging the company to resist efforts to choose the UAW as their collective bargaining representative. In this era, era of cutthroat global capitalism, U.S. auto workers' efforts to win collective bargaining representation are being aggressively opposed, particularly in the southern United States. Workers face a terribly unfair union election process where employers can devote unlimited resources to oppose unionization efforts and dominate the process from beginning to end. In short, elections for collective bargaining representation in the United States are neither free nor fair. Today you will hear from two workers, my colleagues Travis and Morris, who recently tried to form a union at the Nissan assembly plant in Canton, Mississippi. They will tell you firsthand the campaign waged by Nissan to prevent workers from achieving collective bargaining representation. Unfortunately, Nissan's conduct is not an isolated example, but a part of a pattern of abuse in the United States against workers' human rights. Again, I want to thank you for convening this very important hearing, and we ask for the Commission's continued engagement on this critical issue. Thank you. I pass it on to my colleagues. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, proud to be here. Glad y'all allow us to be here. I'm um, Travis Parks. I'm a Nissan technician. I started working at Nissan Canton facility in 2003 shortly after production started. Um, during that time, uh, we were, um, orientation was given to us when we were first come into the plant, and they showed anti-union videos. And this was a, they were telling us that the company is not a union company, and, you know, we took it for what it was, and, and people didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to it. But I did a little research on my own, and I found out Nissan, as a global company, supports unions all over the world. We have the Nissan Renault Alliance. There's 45 factories, and 43 of those are unionized except for the two in the United States. And Nissan operates under the UN Global Compact, which is a 10 principle process where the Principle number three states that Nissan uh, businesses should uphold the freedom of association and the efforts to recognize the right to collective bargaining. Nissan does not, Nissan Canton does not abide by that principle. Um, you know, during the election, we were um, subject to captive audience meetings where management would come in and tell us that to vote no, you do, um, they were using threats, intimidations, you know, the plant closures, loss of benefits, uh, things that were pretty much illegal by labor laws in the United States. But there's, uh, we had a visitor from the French parliament who is actually, uh, Carlos Houghton, who is actually a, the French state is a shareholder in Nissan through the alliance. They own 43% of Nissan, Renault does, which, the French state owns portion of Renault. He stated it best to me that uh, inside that plant is lawless. The laws do not apply to them. Even though we have filed complaints as far as during the election, there was uh, complaints of uh, observation of union-supported workers. 
they were following us on social media. Uh, they were observing us when we were doing turnstile actions, getting people to sign authorization cards so we could get to an election. And uh, even in these captive audience meetings, um, management was wearing shirts that said, this is the front of it. It says, uh, Vehicle Semi Plant, Nissan Canton, our team, our future. But on the back it says, vote no. Now this doesn't seem to be a company to me that respects workers' rights to form a union. This reminds me, living in Mississippi, it reminds me of what happened not too long ago, 50 something years ago, when African American workers were trying to vote in their local elections. They were used fear and intimidations, the fear of losing their lives if they were to register to vote. But at Nissan, they threatened us with the fear of losing our livelihoods. That's something that I take serious, but Nissan does not. Um, this has happened year after year since we've been trying to, you know, to form our union. But, you know, it's hard, it's hard for people to understand that's not living it day to day. When you have management telling you, you know, you got to worry about feeding, you know, feeding your family. This is the best job you've ever had. There's no other jobs like this around in the state, which is not true because our largest private employer in the state of Mississippi is Engle Shipyard. It's unionized. They have better wages, better benefits. They just ratified their contract. But, you know, Nissan tells us, tells the workers that, you know, this is the best you'll ever be, and that's not true. So, you know, I, the disrespect that the workers ha that Nissan has given the workers, we deserve better. I want to thank you. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Hello, my name is Mars Mock, a 14-year Nissan worker. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, the thing is, this is this is a, an important topic that we have. Um, Nissan. Now. I look at it like this. I, Travis and I, we suffering from post-traumatic stress because we fought a war with our company. And this war where they wore shirts and you have managers and human resources wearing shirts, equivalents of people riding around in Klan outfits and threatening and intimidating the workers, right? And you know, the state of Mississippi, we're ground zero. You know, we are two and a half hours away from where Martin Luther King was assassinated. We're an hour and a half away uh, from where the, uh, the three civil rights workers were assassinated. We are uh, 30 minutes away where Megga Evers actually died fighting, and his blood still stains the street today for voter oppression. And I think that this is an important subject that we need to, need to discuss. We have Kelly workers that are being, the female Kelly workers are actually being harassed when getting a job at Nissan. Whenever you sit there and you have a, a Kelly worker that, that's employed, and in order to get a job, now I have daughters, I have two beautiful, beautiful girls, and you tell my daughter that they have to have a good attitude. Now what, and, and not work performance, but you have to have a good attitude in order to be hired. That, that could easily turn into sexual harassment at the workplace. We have that going on. To fight a war, uh, the personal attacks that they, that came out against my own mom and uh, you know, I got an award, and I have to say it, I, I, just, I was speaking about this earlier today, I got an award, and this award is the Y'all Means All Award, and this is the uh, Worker Solidarity Award, and this Worker Solidarity award, award, they actually publicly attacked me for getting an award that supports gay rights, transgender rights, all of these rights, and they actually use that as a part of their anti-union campaign. So anything that they could actually do to fight any personal attack that they used against us, the surveillancing, you know, following us around everywhere we walked, you know, recording every conversation that we have, all of these things went, took place during this campaign. When I tell you that we fought a war, this was a war that Nissan had against their workers. 
I mean, we expect to, we expect to just go home, feed our families, uh, uh, go home safe every single day, not be overworked. Uh, but the Japanese auto industry, they, they have pride in overworking their workers. You know, they, we, we just want to go home safe. There's a, a worker in particular, Derek Whitey, who, who actually laid dead on the floor, and it took an hour or so before someone actually could scra get him up off the, off the floor while the line was continually to run. I mean, we, have, we can't even drink the drinking water inside our factory. You understand? And after the election was over, the only thing that they said is, oh, okay, well, we're going to, we heard your, your, your request. We're going to fix the bathrooms. And all we got out of all of this was some paint on the walls of our bathrooms. They took away long-term disability for any new hires. All of these things are going on. You know, the state of Mississippi spent $1.3 billion to bring this factor here. And they took that $1.3 billion from public education. 1.3. They actually formed an eco chamber of oppression so that you don't want the workforce to get any smarter than what they are right now. We want to continue to pay these workers less than what they were. We don't want them to get any smarter, or so we, we don't want to have to raise the bar when it comes to pay and how, how much they work. You understand what I'm saying? So you have workers that are being injured, being fired for no apparent reason, workers that, that they don't respect the ergonomics inside the factory, where workers, older workers, been there 14, some of them 15 years, and they are overworked. And I think that Carlos Ghosn has this thing of uh, he, his nickname that the Japanese call him is uh, um, the cost killer. And they call, they, they, if you even look at his bio, they call him the cost killer. They call him, uh, he's known for aggressive downsizing. Now, to me, aggressive downsizing is a, is a dangerous thing. When you say you want to downsize, that means that you, that one worker could, could be doing two and three jobs. Now, to me, as a worker who's doing two or three jobs, where I can barely raise my shoulder up, where I can, my, my wife and my kids, I can barely pick my eight-year-old up, these are the things that we go through every single day. We just want to go home safe to our families every single day. That's why we want a union. And I know I may be preaching to the choir, but to actually, I'm, 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 my, my main thing is to invite you all over. Come to Mississippi. You know what I mean? We have a, a civil rights culture there. And I mean, he, Travis, he didn't mention the, 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 uh, uh, the meetings that we had when, he, when they had these meetings, the, the way the pastors prayed that they kept the union out. You know, we had, they, they took every possible scenario of workers, religion, uh, 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 gay rights, they used everything against us. So we welcome all of you. If you want to come to Mississippi to find out what's really going on, we, we really welcome you to Mississippi. The more we build our family, the best. But we welcome all of you to Mississippi to fight for workers' rights and join the workers. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm going to give you some extra time because, first of all, I think you have one speaker left, but could you speak in two minutes, and then you, you'll have the video, which we can do, and you would have the extra time. Um, so, um, are you speaking, yeah. ma'am? Do I go before the, okay, all right. Oh, yes, you have to go, okay, and quickly, you. two minutes. I have two minutes? <laughs> it's extra time. Okay, all right having us today, and in particular, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Mary Joyce Carlson. I am um, a human rights and labor lawyer, and I have also served as the Deputy General Counsel of the National Labor Relations Board uh, during the Clinton administration. Uh, the National Labor Relations Board is the federal agency that's responsible for enforcing uh, the federal law that protects workers and uh, provides worker rights uh, here. My remarks are going to go to two points. One is that, um, as Christine mentioned, the auto industry in particular, uh, following uh, the textile worker, the textile industry in the in the uh, 20s, the auto industry has now decided to locate primarily in the U.S. South, the region of the U.S. South. And there is a reason for this. Uh, the southern part of the United States, uh, for those that I suppose everybody knows, but for those of you who don't know, has a very particular history. While the northern uh, part of the United States used its capital for shipbuilding and um, 
and trade and developing businesses. The southern part of the United States was based on agriculture and the capital was primarily spent uh, for human chattel. And so slavery was an ugly stain in this country for many years uh, until the Civil War was fought and uh, the emancipation happened, and uh, slavery was no more the law of the land here. However, the transition was not quick. The South still may, uh, remained for a long time a primarily agricultural economy with the industry that came based on cotton, based on the production of agriculture, and the, uh, the workers, including both white but principally African-American workers, remained on the land as sharecroppers or tenant farmers. And I free, in fact, one of the civil rights leaders uh, of the great movement here in the mid-century was Fannie Lou Hamer. And she actually was a cropper on a plantation with her children. And I say that what happened to her was one of the earliest versions of the threat, threat to close plants. Because in addition to being beaten in jail for attempting to vote, register to vote over and over and over again, the plantation owner evicted her and her children uh, from their farm, taking away their livelihood. So this threat of taking away livelihood and destroying uh, livelihood is a time-honored tradition. Um, I want to talk also specifically about state laws that were developed in the South, some of which are still on the books. Um, there has been a history of using uh, of uh, laws prohibiting interracial gatherings, preventing black and white workers from meeting together. These laws are still on the books. Uh, they're not, uh, even though they're not implemented, they have not been repealed. Uh, we in the southern states have anti-strike laws that are on the books, right to work laws that are on the books. Uh, both sets of these laws were inspired and advocated by, uh, on the basis of a strike or a union would um, encourage white and black integration. The other th so what did business learn from this? Businesses learned that if they ran uh, anti-union uh, anti campaigns, they could show that interracial labor organizing leads to cross-racial association. Um, finally, I want to, uh, the civil rights movement has been referred to uh, Monday, this past Monday, uh, four months from then will mark the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, the, uh, as uh, was mentioned, the civil rights movement made great gains, but also the people who led it suffered much. Uh, I want to say that the United Auto Workers, which is now leading organizing efforts to bring the right to associate, the right to unions to the southern part of the United States, was a vigorous ally of the civil rights movement. Um, they stood shoulder to shoulder with King and advocated for many rights. Now, the second, the final thing that I want to say is that uh, I, I could tell you about other laws in Mississippi that remain on the books. For example, it is a crime we, we have, to I'm train sorry, people to I'm protest. I'm sorry, I have to cut okay. you off. Okay, all because right, we sorry. Have, we're, yeah, what you can do for us, if you could give us that material, Okay. So we can use it in our deliberations and, okay. and, and All right. follow up. All right. And um, th what about the video? How long is it? 48 seconds. Okay. Okay. Hello, I'm Danny Glover. I want to thank the Inter American Commission on Human Rights for holding this important hearing. Workers' rights are human rights. I have walked every step of the journey with the Nissan workers who you are hearing from today, and I have witnessed the systemic denial of workers' human rights across the United States. I believe it's critically important for the Commission to see what I have witnessed. I want to personally invite you to join me in a site visit to Nissan in Mississippi to see the problem firsthand. I am looking forward to working with you to tackle this enormous human rights problem. Will you join me? Yes, indeed. 
<laughs> Hello, I'm Danny Glover. I want to thank the <laughs> Indian American Commission. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. Um, strictly speaking, you have eight more minutes. I hope you don't use the eight minutes. <laughs> well, I, uh, commissioners, I, I think uh, we will be uh, brief, but we may take slightly more than uh, eight minutes. Thank you. Um, uh, distinguished commissioners, civil society friends, uh, and uh, secretariat colleagues, uh, my name is Kevin Sullivan, and I'm the interim permanent representative, uh, representative of the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States. Uh, and I would like to thank the United Auto Workers and uh, Nissan Workers for their presentations this morning. Uh, we personally thank you for your time. Uh, we would also like to recognize uh, Mr. Danny Glover, who's been active at the OAS for many years, uh, and thank him again for being here this morning, uh, even if uh, by video. Uh, even though many of the presentations we heard uh, this morning were around one particular case, that is being addressed by the appropriate authorities in the U.S., it's important to emphasize uh, from a procedural standpoint that we're here today as part of a thematic hearing uh, under Article 66 of the Commission's Rules of Procedure and not a petition-based hearing under, under Article 64 on uh, any other particular case or situation. <clears throat> and for this reason and because the issues raised uh, in the Nissan case are the subject of an ongoing investigation by the appropriate U.S. authorities, will not be in a position today to uh, address the specific allegations that uh, have been made during this session. Uh, while we understand that this is a case of much interest, especially for Commissioner Venucci, our presentation will focus instead on the thematic issue of labor rights in the United States and generally discuss labor rights uh, in this country. We trust this presentation will give you a better understanding of the robust system for protecting labor and collective bargaining rights in the U.S. Uh, that is the system in which the present matter is being heard. We also wish to note that we were not aware of the site visit uh, Commissioner Venucci conducted in August uh, of this year. Uh, and in the future, we would strongly urge the Commission to provide advance notice of such site visits uh, in accordance with uh, Article 18 of the uh, Commission statute, uh, which would have allowed the United States an opportunity to provide views to the Commission if appropriate. Uh, finally, we note that Commissioner Vanucci, who conducted the visit in an official capacity, issued a statement in his, uh, quote, personal capacity on the situation at Nissan. Such a statement uh, is not contemplated by the Commission statutes or procedure. Internationally, the United States uh, has long taken an interest in the labor rights and conditions of working people around the world. Our participation in the founding of the International Labor Organization in 1919 reinforced our government's belief that universal and lasting peace can be established only if it is based on social justice. Realizing the need to develop a group of specialists who would focus on these issues, President Roosevelt launched a labor attache program within the Department of State. Today, State, the State Department has officials dedicated to advancing labor rights around the world uh, in the Office of International Labor Affairs, housed within the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. And the Labor Officer Corps boasts approximately 40 dedicated officers uh, based at our foreign embassies uh, around the world. Promotion of core worker rights, including the freedom of association, the right to organize and bargain collectively, freedom from discrimination and the elimination of forced labor and the worst forms of child labor have been key components of the U.S. government's labor diplomacy. Our International Labor Affairs Office investigates and reports to the public on countries' labor practices through direct visits to countries and through the State Department's annual human rights report, advocates with governments and organizations on behalf of the most vulnerable workers, promotes worker rights, uh, good governance, transparency, and the rule of law with the private sector, provides training, information, and guidance for embassy staff so they can effectively engage on labor rights and working conditions. Our labor officers in the field are involved in a wide range of activities to advance labor rights, including researching and reporting on key labor issues, uh, including worker rights and labor relations, advocating for improved workers' rights standards, 
cultivating contacts with local labor organizations, governments, NGOs, and private companies, developing and supporting labor-related technical cooperation programs, assisting Washington-based agencies in developing effective labor-related programming, uh, and contributing to the development of overall U.S. government economic policies and engagement strategies. In addition to diplomatic efforts, the State Department's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor funds a range of innovative projects to advance labor rights and empower workers around the world. I'll now provide a quick overview of the National Labor Relations Board, what they do, and some illustrative cases, uh, which may go to the uh, concerns raised this morning. Uh, concerning our domestic efforts on labor rights, um, the National Labor Relations Board, or NLRB, is an independent federal agency created by the United States Congress in 1935 to administer and enforce the National Labor Relations Act. The, that law guarantees the right of most private uh, sector employees to organize, to engage in group efforts, to improve their wages and working conditions, to determine whether to have unions as their bargaining representative, to engage in collective bargaining, and to refrain from any of those uh, activities. It acts to prevent and remedy unfair labor practices committed by private sector employers uh, and unions. Under the NLRA, employees have the right to form or attempt to form a union among the employees of an employer, join a union whether the union is recognized by the employer or not, assist a union in organizing employees, engage in protected concerted activity with or without the assistance of a labor organization. Uh, generally, protected concerted activity is a group activity that seeks to improve wages or working conditions in a particular workplace or refuse to do any or all of these things. Thus, the NLRA forbids employers from interfering with, restraining, or coercing employees in the exercise of rights relating to organizing forming or joining or assisting a labor organization for collective bargaining purposes, engaging in protected concerted activities, or refraining from these activities. Similarly, unions may not restrain or coerce employees in the exercise of these rights. The NLRB strives to create a positive labor management environment for the nation's employees, unions, and employers by assuring employees free choice on union representation and by preventing and remedying statutorily defined unfair labor practices. In carrying out the NLRA's mandates, the NLRB supports the collective bargaining process and seeks to eliminate certain unfair labor practices on the part of employers and unions so as to promote commerce. The general counsel of the NLRB has the sole responsibility to investigate charges of unfair labor practices and to decide whether to issue complaints with respect to such charges, which may bring a case to litigation. The NLRB acts only on those cases brought before it and does not initiate an investigation. All proceedings originate when employees, labor unions, private employers, or other parties file either an unfair labor practice charge alleging statutory rights violations or representation petitions seeking a union election. The NLRB general counsel investigates unfair labor practices, unfair labor practice charges through the agency's network of 49 field offices around the country. If there's reason to believe that an unfair labor practice uh, charge has merit, a field office's regional director on behalf of the general counsel uh, issues and prosecutes a complaint against the charged party unless a settlement is reached. With some exceptions, a complaint that is not settled or withdrawn is tried before an administrative law judge who issues a decision. The decision may be appealed by any party to the NLRB in Washington, D.C. through the filing of exceptions. The NLRB decides cases on the basis of, formal trial rec of a formal trial record uh, according to the statute and the body of case law that has been developed by the NLRB and the federal courts. If the NLRB finds that a violation of the NLRA has been committed, the role of the general counsel thereafter is to act on behalf of the NLRB to obtain compliance with the NLRB's order remedying the violation, and if necessary, to petition a federal court of appeals up to and including the Supreme Court to enforce the NLRB's order. In, in contrast to unfair labor practice proceedings that I just described, 
representation proceedings conducted pursuant to the NLRA are initiated by the filing of a petition by an employee, a group of employees, a labor organization acting on their behalf, or in some cases by an employer. Typically, the petition requests uh, an election to determine whether a union has the support of a majority of the employees in an appropriate bargaining unit and therefore should be certified or decertified by the NLRB as the employee's bargaining representative. The role of the NRB in such cases is to investigate the petition and conduct a secret ballot election, if appropriate, addressing the cha challenges and objections to the election subsequently, and thereafter issuing a certification. In its 82-year history, the NLRB has counted millions of votes, investigated hundreds of thousands of charges, and issued thousands of decisions. In fiscal year 2017, the NLRB received uh, almost 20,000 unfair labor practice charges, of which 38.6% uh, were found to have merit. Issued uh, 1,263 late unfair labor practice complaints, alleging that employers or labor unions violated the NLRA, prevailing in 84% of the cases that went to trial recovered uh, $73 million on behalf of employees as back pay or reimbursement of unlawfully collected fees, dues, and fines, and secured 1,716 offers of reinstatement to unlawfully terminated employees, uh, and finally conducted 1,369 union elections at which over 70,000 voters cast ballots for or against union representation in their workplace. For further information about the NLRB, uh, as well as the online ability to file unfair labor practice charges and representation petitions, can be found at the agency's public website, nlrb.gov. To conclude, we would like to again thank the Commission and our civil society friends at the other table for bringing attention to these important matters, uh, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, I am in your debt. <laughs> Time-wise, thank you very, very much. Um, it now um, is the time for the panel to in interpose questions or comments, and I invite Commissioner Ranuki to make his first. Gracias, Presidenta. Uh, solamente para agradecer la propuesta de esta audiencia, eh, que es también. Uh, Respuesta a una invitación de la CIDH a que también las organizaciones laborales, sindicales, se acerquen más del sistema interamericano para presentar en las audiencias importantes informaciones como estas para que las autoridades de Estado puedan uh, conocer mejor, uh, escuchar testigos, uh, saber de informaciones que sabrán llevar a sus otras instituciones y poderes republicanos para lo que se pueda hacer dentro de un compromiso general del Estado con uh, el respecto a los derechos humanos. El caso también es muy interesante porque involucra la relación con un tema que es naciente y emergente en el sistema universal e interamericano que es de los eh, derechos humanos y empresas que muchas veces se construyen programas nacionales, pero las empresas eh, no les gustan de discutir problemas como ese, de liberación sindical, libertad, de respecto a los convenios de la Organización Internacional de Trabajo. Y en ese sentido que yo estuve por dos veces en visita para conocer, para recoger estos testigos en mi autoridad como uh, el ex responsable por el área de derechos económicos, sociales y culturales, que es un tema también que ahora tendemos. En el comisionado Orozco es eh, responsable por la relatoría eh, de protección de defensores de derechos humanos y muchas veces eh, los trabajadores de sindicatos son defensores, pueden, deben ser considerados defensores de derechos humanos. Y mi colega Soledad, para uh, presentar las cuestiones que tenga como la nueva responsable en la comisión 
é, logo de criada, construída a Relatoria Especial Desca. Margaret, uh, our vice president and relatora para uh, Estados Unidos. Então, vocês agradecer também a uh, mensagem de Danny Glover e solicitar a la comissão, a los que se quedan eh, como comissionados, para que estudem a possibilidade de atender a la invitação eh, para uma visita em loco. Muitas graças. I invite Commissioner Orozco to make his comments. Gracias, Presidenta. También unirme al agradecimiento a la digna representación de, eh, de la sociedad civil como a la digna delegación de los Estados Unidos por su participación en, en esta audiencia temática, ciertamente sobre los derechos laborales y sindicales en la industria automotriz en los Estados Unidos. Y en cuanto a las, eh, las, los señalamientos que formulan las, la, la representación de la, de, de la sociedad civil en cuanto a, a las intimidaciones, las afectaciones al, al derecho a la libertad sindical, yo le consultaría, porque se mencionaba la, la, la última participante en cuanto a que también esto pudiera ser algún aspecto que, que se da más en ciertos estados, ¿verdad? Yo quisiera que, 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 que nos compartieran esa, esa información, ¿verdad?, en cuanto a, 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 a estas, reitero, afectaciones a la libertad sindical, eh, 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 sí eh, 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 se puede identificar que se presenta más dentro de la industria automotriz más en ciertos eh, estados o en algunas partes, eh, en qué parte sería así y cuál habría sido la, y, y, y la respuesta uh, gubernamental sobre el particular y ya nos compartían la, eh, eh, de algunas decisiones de la Junta Nacional de Relaciones Laborales. Entonces, sí quisiera que, que nos compartieran esa, esa información ahora o en un futuro, porque ciertamente está en la agenda de la Comisión Interamericana y eh, eh, este tema, y eh, eh, sin duda desde la Relatoría para Defensoras y Defensores de Derechos Humanos, eh, 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 el, los, eh, eh, tra, los eh, Derecho, los, uh, las personas defensoras de los derechos sindicales son defensores, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, eh, sin duda estarán en la agenda y es del mayor interés mantener la información, obtener información eh, en lo sucesivo sobre este tema. Muchas gracias, Presidente. I invite my sister Soledad Moniz, uh, Special Rapporteur. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, and welcome and to to this important hearing for the special rapporteurship that I am I am starting to to represent and to work for the Commission on this important area. But let me speak in Spanish. <laughs> that is easier in 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 trying to be focused and and to go to the point because we don't have. Uh, too much time, right? <laughs> so, eh, quisiera agradecer muchísimo la oportunidad de tener esta audiencia, agradecer la presencia del Estado como de, de, de los solicitantes y darnos la oportunidad, como bien dijo el comisionado Banuki, de introducir en la agenda de la comisión, en el país que es nuestra sede, además, temáticas cruciales para los derechos humanos en Estados Unidos y en el mundo hoy hablamos, como dijo el señor Danny Glover, workers' rights are human rights, hablamos del derecho de freedom of association, un derecho de, para el que este país ha sido y es ejemplo en muchísimos campos para la, la democracia a nivel mundial. Y es por eso que también escucho con mucha preocupación algunas de las prácticas que nos han ilustrado hoy por parte de la sociedad civil y que aprecio mucho que, que el Estado nos haya brindado información y siga haciéndolo en relación con cómo podemos realmente mitigar prácticas 
que provienen del sector privado y que ponen en juego los derechos fundamentales de los trabajadores y las trabajadoras. En ese sentido, además de ponerme a disposición como relatora para favorecer canales de diálogos en estas materias donde me consta que hay esfuerzos importantes por parte del Estado y los diferentes Estados, también quisiera ponerme muy especialmente a disposición para posibles visitas in loco de acuerdo a, las, eh, a, los, a los órdenes reglamentarios de nuestra comisión, por supuesto, a los estados más afectados y en una estrecha colaboración también con, con el estado representado en esta, en esta delegación. Y preguntar también, me interesa especialmente, porque es un área eh, al cual la relatoría está empezando a trabajar con particular eh, focus sobre cuáles son los adelantos en Estados Unidos en materia de business and human rights y cómo podemos también trabajar coordinadamente en esta dirección para que las empresas, especialmente multinacionales, que se asientan en Estados Unidos, asuman las, eh, las obligaciones en materia de derechos humanos en sintonía con la obligación del Estado también de actuar con la debida diligencia de due diligence, para evitar que estas empresas que tienen un importantísimo rol en el área económica de nuestros estados, también respeten eh, con sus actuaciones los derechos humanos, especialmente de los trabajadores. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Um, th thank you very much. Um, well. It's been said, uh, uh, workers' rights are human rights, <coughs> definitely. And it goes to a basic requirement for human existence, which is to live with dignity and to their identity. Because you, as, as the two gentlemen mentioned, they suffer from PSTD. P PSTD. We suffer from it too. <laughs> but, but it is true. I don't belittle this. This is a fact. When you when you exist under situations of extreme stress, in not being able to realize what is a basic right, you do suffer from from, from this, and we do understand this. And as the rapporteur of women's rights as well, I'm very concerned about what you stated in relation to women who wish to ent enter um, uh, the company as employees. And as the rapporteur of Afro-descendants as well, I have all these hats. Um, um, I am also particularly concerned <coughs> about that. And we would like, uh, as a commission, to go and, and ac uh, accept Dan Gorova's invitation to go and see what is actually happening on the ground, which we would direct to the, the, the representatives of the state here present that we will send a formal request um, for that to, to occur. And I, I, am, I want, we really wish to, to mention this particular fact. Having heard what we have heard, oh, we are concerned that the, those here present who have attended and participated are not in any way questioned or penalized for their um, um, participation here. Because as you know, you, you, you know this for many years, it is a, a real strict requirement and rule that no one who participates in any of our hearings should be penalized in any way or form. So if anything untoward happens, you must let us know so that we can then um, um, deal with your, the, the state representatives here present. And we do ask you to submit. You said you are in the investigations going on. Um, and and that um, one has to underline, and we thank you for, for that happening. And we ask if you could let us have some information in, as to the, the stage of this investigation. And if you have any results, if you can share that with us when the investigation is complete. Because we this is a, a thematic hearing, as you mentioned, and we will have to prepare a report, and so we need as much information as possible um, from the State Department in this regard. Um, it would have been um, particularly helpful if someone 
had been brought from the company um, to answer here, present to, to us, um, and from the, the state, um, what's the word? You know, the, the state government, the state municipal government, whatever it's called. <laughs> um, and you, you too, we need some, inf some more information from you that you can let us have um, and submit to us anything which is ongoing. No, no I'm, I'm going to think. No, I don't want to take up any more time, but to now leave you to um, do your response. Um, but you have five minutes each. So, so I'll fi five minutes for each side. Okay. I didn't mean for each person. <laughs> so I'll try to be quick so also my brother Travis can um, add a couple things. I just want to make, to respond to um, our government colleague um, that, you know, this is not unique to just Nissan. This is rampant in the auto, auto parts, and other sectors that UAW represents, number one. Specifically, the government response to this while we're waiting for an outcome of the pending NLRB cases, the numerous cases that have been filed um, in the case of Nissan as well as um, VW, you know, Nissan and the auto industry specifically was raised, the lack of freedom of association was raised by the UN Special Rapporteur in June. We filed an OECD complaint against Nissan with the U.S. National Contact Point. They found merit in the allegations, but Nissan refused any type of engagement. Um, the, as Travis mentioned, we um, invited a French member of parliament, Christian Houtin, who was shocked by what he found on the ground. So not only has our own government found merit in the gross rights violations on the ground, but so has the French government. There was a letter that was issued jointly by our former labor secretary and the French labor secretary um, calling for an investigation, Labor Secretary Perez and um, French Labor Secretary Al Khomeini. And also it was raised at the UN Global Compact level. And it was dropped due to Nissan forcing the case to be dropped without informing the board um, members. So we find that this is a this is a very big problem. Like I said, we it it political elected officials have interfered in organizing campaigns, not only in Mississippi but in Tennessee, in Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, and most recently Ohio. So this is a massive problem, and we very much appreciate uh, your attention to this. Now, I just want to say thank you. Um, you know, it's, I appreciate the information. That's, that's good information from the LRB. Um, we have filed cases, but the, the, the problem we have in, in Mississippi is the education and the suppression of workers. They're not aware of a lot of the information that's there that they can file these charges. We have incidents where workers have worked 16 hours and only got paid 12 hours. I asked the man if he wanted to get his hours, his pay. He said, don't worry about it. I just want to keep my job. That's the type of suppression we're dealing with here. So, you know, it's a combination of a lot of these things. But, you know, there's a young lady. She didn't do sexual favors for, for overtime. So she was denied that. The supervisor went to the other supervisor and told her, don't give her no overtime because she would not do sexual favors for him. So it's, it's a suppression there that, that goes beyond, and they don't want to speak up because they don't want to lose the job. They don't want the, 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 the um, attention put on them because they have seen retaliation from the company. They just want to go in and go to work. And without people like Morris and other people that's there to step up and speak for them and the union to help them out to understand the process, there's still that type of mentality that, that I'm just glad to have a job and I just want to go to work. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, you know, the Labor Board um, is a progression. It's a progressive 
progressive science that should get better with every, with every step. But we found, being a student of war, being a student of, of studying labor laws, that it, it sometimes doesn't, and sometimes it stalls. And sometimes it's not there for you all the time when you really need it. Uh, and that, that right there, and I'm, and I'm glad that, you know, not trying to take away from the, from the theme of this, this meeting, but this is what we see filing numerous of charges, uh, having, like Travis said, having managers doing, they, workers doing sexual favors, and you know, you have even managers having several children by, by workers. The problem that we also have is, and be very brief, is that you know, even the government in Mississippi passing three anti-union labor laws saying that, uh, that the, this is Governor Phil Bryant saying that, uh, that the factory no longer or the companies no longer have to remain neutral. So we have to, this is a bigger issue that's bigger than just one corporation. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. I just have one point that I want to make. I served as the Deputy General Counsel of the National Labor Relations Board. I am very familiar with this act. I supervise the 49 offices that enforce the act. And the law is a beautiful law, and the employees are dedicated. However, the, pro the key problem, in my view, with this law is that there are incredibly weak remedies. And so businesses tend to make a decision. They do a risk-benefit evaluation. And it's my belief that in many situations, the businesses decide that, it is a, that the risk is worth it to violate the law because the consequence on the other side of it, they can tolerate. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, representatives of the United States. Mr. Sullivan, five minutes. Thank you, Commissioner, five minutes. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to uh, respond again, and uh, I would reiterate our thanks to uh, the commissioner, the commission for its interest in this issue, and to our presenters this morning, uh, who've shared valuable perspectives. Uh, while we are unable, for the reasons that I explained, uh, to respond to the particular uh, case that has been cited, uh, I think our our dialogue this morning has uh, allowed us to engage on broader, important issues uh, thematically that are certainly relevant for the Commission, uh, and uh, we welcome the opportunity as uh, the uh, as uh, Commissioner uh, Garcia Munoz mentioned to engage on, uh, on uh, discussions about uh, these issues in the host country of the, uh, the Commission. Uh, I can also say at a personal level, having grown up in uh, the state of Ohio, I, I grew up uh, steeped in uh, some of the issues involved with the auto industry and worker rights, so I certainly understand how important they are to workers and their families. Um, I would say that um, uh, on a couple of particular matters, uh, there was a question concerning uh, or a, a suggestion that we discuss the links between business and human rights. Uh, it's worth noting that the U.S. has been a strong supporter of the guiding principles on business and human rights. Uh, and urges businesses to look at, uh, to them not only abroad but also in our own country as uh, guideposts and our record as the U.S. in promoting the, these principles uh, around the world is uh, certainly robust. Uh, there was also some discussion of a, a site visit. Uh, I noted that uh, Commissioner McCauley seemed particularly interested in participating in that if Danny Glover were to be hosting it which is understandable, um, but uh, I would only request that uh, any such visit uh, be requested in writing uh, through the appropriate means in the appropriate way, uh, and we will certainly uh, take note of that and, uh, and respond. Uh, and so <clears throat> I would also just kind of summarize uh, our earlier statement to say that uh, issues of labor relations are by nature contentious, difficult, and, and very important to the livelihoods of, of many families. Uh, and uh, while the U.S. does not have a perfect record on these issues, as you know, no country does, uh, I believe that through the National Labor Relations Act and the National Labor Relations Board, we have one of the world's uh, best established and uh, mo most robust systems to protect these rights, uh, and uh, we make uh, we try and provide access to that system through a vast network of offices around the country, uh, and of course, it's a, a, an exercise of uh, continuous improvement to ensure that that system 
uh, can uh, address the challenges that our workers face. Thank you. Um, it remains for me to thank both sides for being here this morning, for informing us uh, on a great deal about this issue, um, which we do take very seriously. Um, because it is a human right, um, which is clearly, um, there's many a slip between the cup and the lip. Many a slip, which is a very good English expression. When we have the legislation, we may have the mechanisms, we may have all that. Good people there, as you mentioned, but when the implementation on the ground does not meet up to that ideal, then there is seriously a slip between the cup and the lip, and that happens all the time in every country. I read a book many years ago called Nickel and Dimed, and yes, uh, and I was shocked. I was upset for months after reading that book, and I one hopes that that is not the true situation nowadays. And being the rapporteur of the United States. I really have to find out where the, what the situation is now, and if she wrote another book on nickel and dime, what that book will contain. But I, I do thank you, and we, we do expect further information from you, and, and also from you, and thank you for, for bringing this matter. Um, my brother, Commissioner, we like music just as much as, as he does, I like. Uh, and he's Brazilian music as well. Um, um, so we thank him very much for, for bringing this and you for coming here to give us information. And, and please remember, if anything untoward happens uh, to anyone in the company or for speaking out to us, you must let us know. With that, call this meeting to an end. Thank you. The next, the next hearing is in seven minutes.